tales for dark nights. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in, turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening. You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 6. I'm your host, Otis Jiry. In tonight's episode, I'll be performing four stories for you, ranging from Lovecraftian horror from a bygone era to tales about the unexpectedly undead, what's waiting beneath the waves and unexplainable sounds from underground, all from the macabre mind of author Tanya Brown. If you enjoy what you hear tonight, please support Tanya by visiting her author page at simplyscarypodcast.com, where you'll find links to her social media, website, and Amazon author page, where you can pick up a copy of her short story collections and more. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which includes the first two stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and our other episodes, Featuring Twice the Terror, simply visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. It's time to get started, so lock your doors, turn the lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. Our first tale of terror this evening set in the Prohibition era, comes to us straight from Tonya Brown's three-story collection, Triple Shot of Southern Horror, now available on Amazon.com. A give to you, Devil Drink. Butch knocked back the last swig in his mason jaw before he let out a resounding belch. He smacked his lips as he passed the jaw back to Beulah. Damn, but if that ain't worth all the trouble it causes. She smiled wide and toothy. Well, thank you, Sheriff Buchanan. It means so much to me that uh, you appreciate my work. Appreciate? Butch laughed a bit. I don't know about all that, but I do enjoy the result. The older woman shrugged her bony shoulders, creaking as they flexed under the straps of her sundress. You know what they say, six in one hand, half a dozen in the other. Butch held up and wiggled his right hand. Oh, rather three in my case, huh? The stumps of his two first two fingers writhed against the old brothers. No offense, man. None taken. Thanks for the drink, Beulah. Butch grabbed the handles of the apple crate and got to his feet. The jars inside clinked as they shifted in place. I suppose this settles us up for the month. 
Go do in business, would you, as usual? Beulah nodded to the patrol car parked in the overgrown yard behind Butch. What about the kid? The new officer? What about him? Seems kind of rude. Wouldn't even get out of the car, should we worry? Nah, he's just nervous. Butch leaned in to whisper. He's from up north. Green as grass, but he's got a good heart. You'll see. You drink much? Not right now, but give him long enough and he'll come around. Town this small is bound to drive that city slicker right into the bottle. Which laughed at the idea as he made to leave. Bula grabbed Butch's arm before he could walk away. She narrowed her eyes, all the humor gone from her. I don't have to remind you how much is riding on my work. Butch swallowed hard as he pulled his elbow from Beulah's grasp. There was always a weird feel in the geezer's touch that made Butch's missing fingers itch. No, you don't. I'll make sure that your kid understands, too. To do just that, Sheriff, just that. Beulah retreated into the darkness of his shack before Butch could say another word. To the best of his memory, Butch had never been inside of Beulah's place, nor did he want to. Something about the whole mountaintop made Butch's fingers twitch, dance, and itch. He had heard of phantom pains before, and from time to time he could feel his missing fingers so wholly that he would make to use them before remembering they were gone. But as soon as he was within a mile of Beulah Walker's property... His fingers not only felt whole, they felt real. More real than amputated fingers should feel. Butch held the crate tight to him as he plodded back to the patrol car, the deep clank of the jars setting his nerves on edge. He hated when Bueller closed the deal on such a bewildering note. While it was true, the old woman always carried an air of mystery— Nothing made her seem more mysterious than when she talked about her work. No one really knew what Beulah's work was, and truth be told, no one wanted to know. All anyone knew was that Beulah made the best moonshine this side of Black Mountain, and was generous with her wares as long as they left the old girl alone about it. But there was something in Beulah's voice that made Butch uneasy a warning in her tone that left Butch's skin crawling. By the time he made it back to the car, his mood had soured worse than the shine. "'What's that all about?' Kirk asked. "'Nothing you need to worry about,' Butch said. Kirk eyed the crate as Butch slid it into the back seat. "'What's in the jars?' "'Your mama's piss.' The young officer frowned. "'That's not a very nice thing to say.' And stop asking questions that don't need asking. With a grunt, Butch wedged his ample frame behind the wheel, turned over the engine, and backed the car down the long drive. There was a blessed period of peace as Kirk, insulted into silence, kept his trap shut. Butch used the time to work on how he planned on explaining the way of things to the new officer. He was hoping that just dragging the kid out to Beulah's place and letting him take a few swigs of the stuff would do the trick, but no. The boy wasn't just green, he was a prude. Everything had to be by the book. And no matter how you put it, bootlegging was definitely not by the book. How do you like uh, Black Ridge? What you ask, trying to find a common ground on which to work things out. It's okay, Kirk said, a little bit small for my taste, but okay. Small is right. I would say it was a one-horse town, but we don't even have a horse, Butch smiled. Kirk didn't. Anything I can do to make you more comfortable, Butch asked. No, I'm fine. No, he didn't sound fine. The kid's voice was laced with tetchiness. It took everything Butch had not to just make him walk the ten miles back to the station. Butch drew a deep breath and braced himself as he said, 
Sorry I raised my voice back there, son. The officer visibly relaxed at the apology. Thank you. Not at all. You had every right to ask what you asked. I see. And does that mean I get an answer? Or just an apology? Well, see, son, it's awfully complicated. I see. The young officer crossed his arms, his body language belying his words. Butch could tell the kid didn't see at all. He needed more information. Which was where Butch was headed anyway. But, Butch said, I am willing to tell you if you're willing to listen. Kirk seemed to think about this for a moment before he said, Now listen, I don't think I'm going to like what I hear, but I'll listen. Butch supposed that was the best he was going to get from this brat. Let's start with what you think you know. Why don't you tell me what's in the jars? Alcohol. Correct. Which makes the old lady a bootlegger. Correct again. Which last time I checked was illegal, as in the possession of said alcohol. And that is three for three. Way to go, kid. Butch laughed. Want to try for another? It's double or nothing. Again, Kirk showed no sign of humor. I fail to see why this is so amusing. You drive out here during business hours to pick up an illegal load of homemade liquor. That doesn't seem funny to me. It seems wrong. Burt sighed, heavy and deep. He was beginning to regret bringing the officer along. But he knew it was a simple case of deal with it now or deal with it later. And Butch always considered himself a let's-get-this-over-with kind of guy. Kirk, I know what you're thinking, and can cut that shit out right now. This isn't as bad as it looks. I would love to believe that, but I just can't. Bootlegging is against the law. We are here to protect the law. There's nothing you can say to make it seem okay. Oh, hell, Beulah ain't really running shine. Why, she's got less customers than I got fingers. Kirk went a fine shade of pink as his gaze snapped Butch's missing digits. Butch let the moment stretch into an uncomfortable minute as the kid squirmed at the illusion. After a bit of this, Butch finally chuckled. It's okay, son. That was supposed to be a joke. It's true, though. Bueller might make moonshine, but this, she doesn't sell it to just anyone. Butch wrinkled his nose and added, Come to think of it, she doesn't really sell it at all. Most folks I know she gives it to. Not much of a bootlegging business, if you ask me. It doesn't matter if she donates it to charity. It's still illegal. I know I'm the new guy here, and I don't really want to rock the boat, as it were, but I can't sit idly by while you accept the bribes. Bribes? You got the wrong idea. No, I have the right idea about your wrongdoing, and I intend to put a stop to it. Butch decided to give it one more try. After all, he reckoned that reason was what separated the men from the monkeys. Well, that tails. Listen, Beulah and her family were making shine long before the powers that be decided it was a bad thing. It's her family trade. Her father made it before her and his father's father. Everyone within six counties on knows about it, and even when they passed the laws against it, no one really cared. She's just a fixture around here, like an old building or a statue. Sure, she passes some of the stuff off, sort of under the table like, just as a reassurance that we'll let her keep making it. Most of us don't even drink the stuff. No harm, no foul. Well, unless this Mrs. Bulow's under-the-table clientele includes the mayor and the rest of the force, then you have a lot of explaining to do when we get back. Butch suppressed a grin, turned his attention back to the road, and began to whistle, trying his hardest not to laugh aloud at the young officer's words. The kid didn't even know the half of it, but he would learn. They always learned. You're kidding, Kirk huffed loudly. The whole force? Well, Butch said, considering the whole force is one other guy and a part-time secretary, there really ain't much, is it? He wondered if Dan and Mary would mind him referring to them as not much. The kid's eyes were wide with wonder. But the mayor? 
Butch nodded. Is there anyone in this cesspool not corrupted by this Beulah person? The brakes whined as the car ground to a screeching halt. Kirk jolted forward, bracing himself against the dash and clinging to his seatbelt for dear life. Borch halfway wished the boy had slammed his head on the windshield. That would have made things a whole lot easier in the long run. He'd let the car idle in the middle of the road while he drew a deep, calming breath. When he was ready to speak without shouting, he did so without facing the new officer. You listen to me and listen hard. The folks in this town are decent good people. Most of them would give you the shirt off their back and happily freeze to death while you keep warm. They work hard and play harder. It ain't their fault that some bigwigs upstate decided to take away their liquor. Now, as long as they aren't shooting up the town hall or each other, then it isn't my place to begrudge them the occasional drop if the mood strikes them. Or yours, do you understand? But bootlegging, the kid started. I said, do you understand? Butch shouted over him. From the corner of his eyes, Butch could see Kirk pursed his lips. But the kid kept his opinions to himself. That was a good start. Then the kid nodded, which was an excellent move on the young man's part. Any other response, and Butch supposed he might have really made the kid walk the rest of the way back. Good. Butch said. I'm glad we're clear now. Yes, sir. Any questions? Just one. Butch lifted his gaze to the worn cloth roof of the cruiser, as if seeking help from above. And what's that? How'd you lose your fingers? The question was so casual, so unexpected, that it threw Butch for a loop. He looked down at the fingers in question, searching their wild scars hard for the answer. As he stared at the mosaic of his finger stumps, a distant gibbering rose in his mind, a wild intoning of unpronounceable syllables that threatened to drive him mad. The longer he listened, the longer he looked, and the more he remembered. And the more he remembered, the more he wished he didn't. Sweat broke across his barrel stinging his eyes as it rolled down his pale face. His phantom fingers scratched at the steering wheel, tapping out a pleading code, begging him to forget, forget, forget. Sir? Butch jumped as the sound of Kirk's voice wedged through the fog of memory. Are you okay? Kirk asked. You look ill. Then the memory was gone and Butch was grateful for it. Yeah, I'm fine. Must have been something I ate. He forced a belch for effect. Or maybe something you drank? Kirk raised an eyebrow. Let it go, Officer Durham. Kirk turned away, facing the window before he said, Yes, sir. Good boy. Butch put the car in drive and eased it back into locomotion. Now, let's get back before Dan panics and calls the county mounties to look for us. Why would he do that? Are you kidding? Once he called the FBI in because he thought I went missing. Kirk waited as if expecting a further explanation. Butch waited, expecting Kirk to ask for it, which he did. And were you missing, I mean? Hell no, son. I fell asleep in the station, John. For the first time since he arrived, the young man finally cracked a grin. The bathroom? Yeah, imagine my surprise when I woke up to find half the town forming a search party for just little old me. That grin bloomed into a genuine smile, and Butch hoped the whole matter of Beulah and her illegal liquor was settled once and for all, but he had a sinking suspicion it wasn't. No, sir, not by a long shot. The rest of the day went by with all the speed of an ordinary southern afternoon. That is to say, it was boring and slow. They had ten wreck calls, every single one about the same fender bender, three noise complaints about the rowdiness of Bill Johnson's yearly cookout, all from the same little old biddy who lived next door to Bill, 
and one request that Butch come out and shoot a rabid dog what was foaming at the mouth, which turned out to be Mark Henderson's new puppy and a batch of peach-scented soap the poor thing couldn't seem to resist. All in all, it was a typical day. And while the new officer seemed to settle down a bit, Butch couldn't help but wonder what was going on behind the kid's dark eyes. Did Kirk really believe he was on the trail of a terrible ring of bootleggers? Or did he realize that that ring consisted of a few middle-aged men who mostly used Beulah's moonshine to strip paint and clean carburetors? Butch hated to admit it, but he got the feeling Kirk wasn't quite done with the whole thing. And when it came time to shut down for the night, that feeling was still nagging at him, right in the pit of his gut. Headed home, Butch asked. Kirk shook his head as he made his way to his sedan. I'm going to go for a drive first. Nice night. Thought I'd take in some air before I headed back to the boarding house. You do that. See you tomorrow. Tomorrow. I know it's Saturday, but I'd like for the guys to at least check in once on the weekend, if you can. Oh, Kirk paused to draw out a wide smile. I think you'll see lots of me tomorrow. Butch frowned and furrowed his brow, unsure if he liked the sound of that. The kid's voice had a vaguely threatening tone to it. Hell, it had a heavenly threatening tone when one got right down to it. Kirk must have realized how his words came off because he backpedaled just as quickly. I mean, I've got a lot of training left to do, lots of manuals to read, stuff like that. Good night. And with that, the kid ducked into his car and sped off. Which is good, roiled with worry, the kind of worry a cop couldn't ignore. So he slipped into his car and, leaving his lights dimmed, he shadowed the boy. Shadowed the kid straight out to Beulah's place. Son of a bitch, Butch whispered to himself as he parked behind Kirk's empty car. They were still at least a mile from Beulah's little shack. Kirk must have decided to take the rest on foot. Butch cursed his cushy lifestyle as he trekked that last mile, huffing and puffing up the rocky path. After a breathless hike up the mountainside, he saw the shack lights flickering between the trees. Butch stopped a minute to catch his breath and prepare his mind. There had to be a way to stop Kirk from making this mistake. What harm was there in a little drop now and again? What trouble did this little arrangement cause? None. That was the answer to both questions. The real question was how to make the kids see it their way and not go babbling to the state officials about things he didn't really understand. When he gathered his senses, Butch pulled his weapon and eased up to the shack. His missing digits danced and jumped against the butt of the gun cradle to his palm. Butch wheeled his phantom members still as he peeped into the hut. Butch spent many a night wondering what the inside of Beulah's house looked like, but the reality of it was disappointing. It was nothing more than a tumble-down room full of dilapidated furniture and a rickety, rusty wood stove in poor excuse for a kitchenette. And sure enough, Kirk had Beulah face first against the wall at gunpoint. The old girl's spindly arms were raised high while Kirk shouted various statutes and commands at the woman's back. Butch sighed and wished like hell he would have taken a little longer to get to know the boy before he exposed him to the criminal underbelly of the small town of Black Ridge. I done told you, boy, Beulah said over her shoulder. I got some more important things to do than to take up a fight with the likes of ya. And I told you to keep your hands where I can see him, Kirk demanded. But if and you don't let me do my work, I said keep those hands up. That's enough. Which said as he pushed through the door into the shack. It's about time you got here, Buell shouted. Sir? Kirk asked, swinging his weapon in Butch's direction. Whoa, son, Butch said. Lower that thing. You'll put an eye out like that. Butch kept his own gun pointed to the floor, leading by example. After Kirk took the hint and lowered his gun, Butch asked, 
what in the hell are you doing out here? I should ask the same of you, Kirk said. Did you follow me? Or did you just chance out here for more of that demon drink? Butch rolled his eyes. Demon drink? Really? Yes, really. You don't know what you're talking about. Yes, I do, Kirk raised his gun again, shifting it between Beulah and Butch as if to prove his point. And I intend to tell the whole world about this little arrangement you have going up here. Government officials in cahoots with a backwoods bootlegger. Backwoods bootlegger, Gilly shouted as she whipped about in place. All I do for this town and this is the thanks I get? Calm down, Beulah, Butch said. You tell him to calm down? I got some important work to do and I'm getting behind. You see, Butch asked Kirk, she got work to do. Let's just go back to my house and I'll get the missus to make us up some coffee and pie and we can talk about all this. No, Kirk shouted. I will not let you sway me with promises of pie. What is so damned important about distilling spirits anyway? As if in answer to his question, there came a deep groaning that seemed to emanate from the shack itself. What was that? Kirk asked. Butch shrugged while, to his surprise, Beulah laughed. In for it now, Beulah said. What? Kirk asked. What does that mean? The groan rolled through the shack again, this time lasting a little longer than before. The few pieces of glassware that rested on the kitchen counter tapped against one another. With a deep groan, Butch's phantom fingers burned right down to their stumps. What is that? Kirk asked. Or should I ask who? He glanced about the shack until his eyes landed on a rug in the dead center of the small room. The kid pounced on the rug, grabbed the edge, and started pulling it away, much to the chagrin of Beulah. Now, boy, Beulah warned, you don't really want to be doing that. Kirk ignored the woman, who really wasn't making much of an effort to stop the kid. Just as Kirk uncovered a trap door hidden by the rug, the groan rolled again, this time turning into a deep, throaty grumble. Oh, ho, ho, what do we have here? Butch would have wondered the same thing, but at that particular moment, his fingers pushed the question out of his mind and set his world on fire with pain. He dropped his gun, unable to hold on to it while his fingers went aflame and fell to his knees. Kirk either didn't notice Beulah's distress or didn't care. He grabbed the latch of the trap door and said, Why don't we see what you really have been up to, Mrs. Beulah? In fact, if that is your real name. It's my real name, boy, Beulah snapped. And that down there ain't nothing you're going to mess with. Trust me. The grumble turned into a roar, and the shack trembled about him, threatening to fall right on their heads. What are you hiding down there, Kirk asked, and flung open the door. The shack went still as the grumble turned into a whisper. My lord, Kirk said, is there someone down there? Hello? But anyone with ears to hear could tell it wasn't the whisper of a fellow human being was too thin, too high-pitched, a chittering whisper of a timeless language that slid past the ears without disturbing the hammers or drums to stroke gently at the mind and warp its soundless words about the soul, not so much heard as imagined, not so much perceived as dreamed, and in that whisper, in that unearthly dialect, Butch remembered. He remembered everything. The same questions he at once asked, the price of his curiosity and just where his fingers disappeared to so many moons ago. For God's sakes, Kirk, get away from there. Why, are you in on this little scheme, too? Not only are you bootlegging, you're in some kind of human trafficking. Beulah's laughter was dynamic in its richness. She giggled and laughed while the whispers poured from the cellar door and straight into Butch's memory. You think you're so smart, you don't know your ass from your elbow. 
which got to his feet, sure in his sudden knowledge that he could save Kirk, just as his own sheriff tried to save him. Officer Durham, please, I'm begging you. There is so much more here than you can possibly understand. Just back away from the cellar. Let Beulah do her work. Yes, boy, Beulah snapped. Back off and let me do my thing. Kirk, who seemed to really hear the whispers now, turned to Butch. What is that? That that sounds, I don't know, inhuman. It's not human, Butch said. Now back away. What is it? Kirk asked, entranced by the language. Butch gritted his teeth and knew the kid's natural curiosity would get the both of them killed. He knew what was in the cellar, and he didn't want the kid to find out. Not like this. Kirk, please, just step away before it's too late. Yeah, Beulah said, encouraging the boy to back off. I don't really want to let it get the taste for blood again. Takes too damn long to get it back on the shine once it's had a bit of the red stuff. What is that supposed to mean? Kirk asked. Butch held up his mangled hand to show Kirk just what Beulah meant. It means if you don't back off, then you'll regret it. Now trust me, back off slowly. But what is it? Kirk asked. A thick tendril, black as night. Cold as the distant stars emerged from the hole in the floor. It lashed, flicking back and forth, feeling about as if searching for something to wrap itself around. What in the hell is it? Kirk asked again. It's old, and it's hungry, Beulah said as if she took a few steps toward Kirk. And I keeps it asleep by slipping it a heaping helping of the shine every night, which I was trying to do when y'all came up in here like you owned it that place. Kirk looked more confused than ever as he eyed a second rising tendril of darkness. Kirk, Butch begged, it doesn't matter what it is, just walk away. Listen to your pop bear, little one, Beulah said, moving closer to Kirk as she spoke. This ain't his first rodeo. Kirk cut his eyes at Butch and pointed at the whipping tendrils. You know about this? He sure does when it suits him to remember it, that is. Ask him what happened to his papa bear when he was standing in that same place you standing at right now. Asking the same asinine questions you're asking right now. Butch's face burned at the shameful memory. What happened? Kirk asked. This, Beulah said and thrust out her hands. Kirk fell into the cellar without so much as a cry, and the tendrils followed him. No! Butch hollered, but it was too late. Kirk was gone, and Beulah was closing the cellar door as if nothing had happened. Butch tried to push Beulah away to reopen the cellar door, but between the burning of his phantom fingers and the ungodly strength of the old man, it was no use. Instead, he fell to his knees and cried, You bitch! Now, now, Sheriff Buchanan, Beulah said, that ain't no way to speak to me, is it? Go to hell. Hell! You'd have laughed low again. I done lived my whole life taking care of that thing and keeping it from unleashing on this town. And you think I worried about a little place like hell? Hell would be a vacation. Now go to sleep, little butch. No sooner had the geezer spoken his name than butch collapsed into a deep and troubled sleep. When he awoke, butch was stretched across the bench on Beulah's porch. He sat up, rubbed his eyes, and wondered what in the hell he was doing there. About time you woke up, Eula said. Butch saw the older woman propped up in her usual chair, grinning like a monkey under the full moon. What? was all he could manage to say. You come out here looking for that kid of yours and hit your head on the way out of my house. Butch rubbed his head as the night's events came flooding back to him. Well, most of the night's events. 
That's right. I followed Kirk out here. Where'd he go? Eula shrugged. Don't know. Said he had business elsewhere. Oh, shit. He'd probably gone to the state troopers. Jesus, Beulah. I'm so sorry for bringing him out here. Nah, not at all. Besides, I don't think we'll have any trouble from him again. You think? Beulah nodded, the grin growing wider. Had a nice long talk with the boy and sent him on his way. Seemed awful eager to go home and see his mom pa. Huh, you sure? Sure, sugar, the grin never faltered. I guess I should go then, Butch scratched at the space of his missing fingers as they jitterbugged against his thigh. Butch needed to get away from here before the stumps danced right off his hand for good. Sorry to fall out on you like that. No worries, that door beam too low. I have my own fool head on it sometimes. I'll get out of your hell then. Butch got to his feet slowly, the porch swimming with his aching head. I... I just... what? I feel like I'm forgetting something. Beulah's grin relaxed into a soft understanding. That's good, though, ain't it? Ain't it good to forget sometimes? Butch, unsure what that meant, but wise enough not to ask, just nodded his head and walked away ignoring the deep burn of his missing fingers and the unforgettable sensation that he was leaving something behind. Or maybe someone. Our second story this evening is entitled Sweetbread. Mary Mooney stood in the doorway of her kitchen with a shotgun aimed at her icebox. Or rather, she aimed at the black-clad rump of some stranger poking out of her icebox. The rump wiggled about as its owner, front, half-rooted through her leftovers. Now it wasn't unusual for someone to stop by for a glass of iced tea or an hour's gossip but never unannounced and certainly not at five in the morning. Mary caught the flash of a blueberry pie in the middle, scooped away. The whole freshly baked pie was spoiled. My icebox ain't no trough, she said. The rummaging stopped as the rump stilled. Mary reached inside and flicked on the light. Get your hands up, she demanded and step away from the pie. She cocked the gun to show the rump she meant business, which she most certainly did. A big pair of hands caked with filth and every nail black with grunge, lifted as the stranger slowly stood. He was as tall as a fridge, nearly as broad, and looked like he hadn't seen the inside of a wash tub in a good year. His gray hair lay greasy on his grubby neck. His black jacket was sorrowfully tattered, too short for his long arms and covered in mud. He looked like he had spent the last hour rolling around in the pig pen. Sort of smelled like it, too. Now, turn around, Mary said, real slow like. One wrong move and I'll empty this here buckshot into your butt. When he finally turned to face her, Mary regretted having asked him to do so. He was a horrible sight. The skin of his face that was not covered in blueberries had a sickly green tint to it. A moldy hide stretched taut across his skull. His lips were thin, black lines pulling tightly away from his blueberry-stained teeth in an eerie half-grin. His eyes were milky, dark marbles floating free in their sockets. In short, he was a monstrosity. A big, filthy, blueberry pie-stealing monstrosity. Hey, honey, it said through a mouthful of pie. 
It was then that Mary recognized him as her big, filthy, blueberry pie-stealing monstrosity. Rufus? she asked. She dropped the shotgun and covered her mouth as her eyes fled wide with horror. Careful, Mary Bear, Rufus said as he pointed to the clattering gun. But Rufus, Mary said through her fingers, you're d d dead. Well, that's uh, fine. How'd you do? Come down for a snack and you want to kill me for it. Rufus frowned as he wiped the pie from his face. He stopped as he spied the berries on his muddy sleeve. Understanding must have come upon him, for he looked duly guilty. That pie was for church, weren't it? I'm sorry, sugar. Ain't no need to shoot me over it. He stretched his black lips back, baring his teeth. Mary's stomach lurched at the gruesome sight. What should have been a sweet smile ended up a slavering snarl. Her knees wobbled and she grabbed a kitchen chair to steady herself. Rue, she said, hun, it ain't about the pie. You're dead, honey, stone dead. You been at my still, Rufus asked. He raised half a brow, cocked his head at her with a loud crack. You've been dead bout near two weeks. Mare's knees went weak as she plopped into a chair at the opposite end of the table, far from her dead husband. You sure you ain't been at the shine, he asked again. He jerked his chair from the head of the table, and the sound of twisting leather rose from his knees as he sat. Rue, we put you in the ground and everything. Rufus looked down at his dirt, caked hands, and soiled suit. Mary thought he looked like he'd just crawled free from a hole in the ground. But that was to be expected because he had indeed just crawled free from a hole in the ground. Well, he said, that could explain a lot. I thought I fell asleep in the field and got all plowed over by Charlie. No, Rue, you was dead, I swear it. She slid a pie pan down the table. Look at yourself. Rufus lifted both brows to her as he raised the pan to his face. He fell silent as he stared at the monster staring back at him. Mary's heart went out to him, even if he looked like hell. That ain't me, he said. He patted his rotting face with a decaying hand. Oh, Mary Bell. What happened to me? You don't remember, she said. Charlie kicked you in the chest, broke your chest bone and crushed your heart. At least that's what the doc said. Rufus tossed the pie pan to the table. Damn mule ain't never been nothing but trouble. He ran his hand over the breast of his muddy suit, his breast giving in soft where his heart should have been. Mary prayed he wouldn't open his shirt to look inside, for fear she might see what was left inside his insides, and that would be too much inside for one woman to bear. He looked back at his reflection and frowned. Am I really dead? Didn't you see your stone when you came up? she asked. It was dark. Plus, I wasn't really looking for it, was I? You don't wake up in a hole and just assume... You're in a grave, do you? I wouldn't really know. He crossed his arms and snorted. A small squirt of mud shot from his right nostril and landed on the pie pan. Well, speaking from experience, you don't. And it wasn't like there was a whole lot of graveyard giving me a hint. Well, you said you wanted to lay to rest on the farm. Weren't no help that I had to rush the funeral. Why rush it? I wasn't going nowhere. In this summer heat, you set the stinking right away. How was it? Rufus asked suddenly. Well, it was kind of like 
I don't know, maybe boiled fish heads mixed with wet manure and a week old eggs? Because you smell a lot less now, but I, I reckon. I don't mean my scent, woman. I meant my funeral. Mary glared at him and pursed her lips. A tight silence hung between them. He may have been dead, but he wouldn't talk to her like that. She didn't let him talk to her like that when he was alive. Death didn't change the respect you should have for your wife. I see dying ain't done nothing for your temper, she finally said. Rufus hung his head. Besides, she said, I don't really remember a whole lot about it. I were knee-deep in grief over you, Rue. You don't remember nothing, he whined. If I'd have known you'd be back for play-by-play, I'd have took notes. Mary crossed her arms and returned her lips to their previous purse. The couple fell quiet and stared at one another. Thirty years of marriage had seen them through a lot, but nothing prepared them for this. What could have prepared them for such a thing? It wasn't like Preacher Pruitt down at the Antioch Baptist Church gave weekly marriage counseling sessions for wives and their dead husbands. Or was Rufus undead? Mary wasn't sure. Sorry about the pie, Rufus said, but I couldn't help myself. I got this powerful hunger, Mayor Bear. As if on cue, a rumble rolled across the quiet kitchen, and Rufus covered his belly with his big hands. Mary clicked her tongue. What? Rufus asked. Nothing, she lied. You're clucking like a mother hen. That means you got your idea. Mare frowned. She didn't want to think of this dead thing as a roux, but he sure acted like it. He also acted like something else. Maybe you're one of those things they make their movies about, a, a zombie. Rufus scowled even harder as his stomach rolled again. You ain't never seen a zombie movie, have you, Rue? She asked. Rufus shook his head and his neck creaked like a dry wind blowing across an old tombstone. Mary had only seen one zombie movie when she was much younger. But she was sure they all pretty much had the same plot. Zombies eat people. The brains, mostly, her words trailed off. Rufus raised his face, sniffing at the kitchen air like an old hound dog. Brains, you say? Rufus asked as he breathed deeply, as if enjoying a sudden delectable scent. He nosed around, sniffing and snorting. You got something on the stove? Something smells awful good. He sniffed toward her. I think it might be coming from you, Mayor Bear. Rufus Mooney, despite his best effort to the contrary, began to drool. Mary stared as the dead man raked his black tongue back and forth across his putrid lips. He was looking at her the same way he looked at her whenever he wanted that certain special something, which was to say he looked at her with hunger. She went white with terror. Her look of horror seemed to snap Rufus back to his senses. He lost the look of hunger and shrugged as casually as he could imagine. I don't think I could rightly eat people. Thank God for small miracles, she said softly. Besides, he said between chuckles, if all I eat were brains, I'd starve in this town within a week. He laughed hoarsely. Mary shuddered at the horror of it, but... Podver laughed with him. Podver knew he was an abomination, but Podver wanted him to stay. But want as she might, she knew in her heart that Rufus was long gone, kicked to death by his own ass. She stood and went to the fridge. She might have to send him away, but she didn't have to send him away hungry. Maybe we can find something to satisfy your hunger. That's more like a wife, Rufus said. An idea struck Mary, and she stopped mid-search, lingering in the cool air of the fridge. You know, I'm not really your wife. Not no more. What you mean? I still got my ring. Rufus rubbed at it, then held up his decrepit left hand. 
A golden band glowed against the ghastly flesh. Mary shook her head as she closed the fridge door. Don't you remember our wedding vows? Yeah, love, honor, and obey. Now obey and make me some flapjacks, woman. Mary looked down at Rufus. I meant the bid at the end. His milky eyes lit with unholy desire. He said I could kiss the bride. She shook her head again. Till death do we part. So? Honey, you died. Mary waited as the bitter truth sank into Rufus's soft skull. I can't stay, can I? He whispered. No, she said. I love you, Rue, but you know you can't stay, not like this. She ran a trembling hand across his skeletal face. Without warning, Rufus pushed her away, stood and stalked towards the door. Rufus! Mary shouted, but didn't give chase. She heard the door slam as the first tears came. It was as painful as the day they brought his broken body home. Hurtful as watching them lower his casket into the ground. Heartbreaking as knowing he was dead and gone. No, it was far worse. Mary sat at the table, staring at the muddy tracks on her kitchen tiles. Suddenly she heard a dull knock at the door. She ignored the knock as she pushed around the filthy pie pan. Rufus was dead and gone. Perhaps she had imagined the entire thing. The knock came again. Mary went to the door just as the knock doubled in time and strength. She pulled the door open wide, ready to bless out her early morning visitor when she found a pleasant surprise on her porch. It was Rufus, propped against the porch frame, still muddy, still smelly, and still dead. Widow Mooney, he said. Mary stared at him in silence. Ma'am, I'm sorry about your recent loss, but I must confess I've had my eye on you for some time. Unfortunately, I have to go away for a while. I don't know how long I'll be, or if I'll ever come back. I'm sorry to hear that, she said. You seem like a fine man. Rufus turned his milky eyes to the horizon and nodded. I thought maybe we could break some bread and watch the sunrise one more time before I go. Mary wiped away her bitter tears. As long as it ain't my sweet bread, Rufus grinned. It should have been goofy. Instead, it was gruesome, and Mary didn't mind at all. Come on in, she said, opening the door wider. I was just making flapjacks. And Rufus Mooney came home one last time. Thanks for joining me tonight for Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you like what you heard and would like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's episode, which includes two more terrifying tales... Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, where you can sign up for a season pass and get access to all 24 ad-free extended episodes from this season, or sign up as a patron for just $5 per month and get access to not just my show, but our network's audio archive of hundreds of previous releases, including premium versions of our other shows, such as the Simply Scary Podcast and Horror Hill. Not only that, but you'll be lending your support to this very program and help me continue bringing nightmares to life each and every week. Thank you very much for your support. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. 
Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, the Otis Jiry channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at Otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? (laughs) Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. (laughs) 